has been on the move in our church. I'm so thankful for all the good things that are happening and breakthrough moments. We had our 21 days of prayer and fasting, and then we, we had our vision night, and God is doing things in each of our locations. And uh, I just want to encourage you that there can still be breakthrough in your life and in your family. And we've been addressing specific things that believers can and should be breaking through. A couple weeks ago, we talked about authority and the difference that it makes. And if you haven't caught up on those messages, I encourage you to do it because it will be helpful to your life just to be thinking about how can I break through. And today, we're going to talk about forgiveness. And Kevin Ramsey and Sarah Ramsey are going to be with us, and they're going to share a powerful story. It's also on our Shepherd Hearted Leader podcast. I gave a little preview if you haven't listened to that at all. There's a probably a fuller uh, story in that podcast. But today they're going to be very focused in on how do you forgive. And afterward, if you want to catch their book, they have a book called A Fight to Forgive. You can catch it online. Um, we may have it available in some of our locations, but at least you can check it out. I want to encourage you to think about how you can forgive. Watch this video as we set up the message of today, Fighting to Forgive. You're going to look right at center, Kim. Why don't you just give us your name and tell us where the story started. My name is Kevin Ramsby, and on August 4th, 2009, um, a man broke into my home and stabbed me 37 times. We always felt safe, and then our neighbors here became our friend. Joe lived across the street. He would bring us the most amazing catfish over our house. Um, are you, are okay? you sweet? How are you? The pleasure is all mine. How's it? So I already talked about you. your catfish that you brought us. <laughs> I'll cook some more. I'll eat some. <laughs> you brought some. us some. You? you remember our this daughter? She was. Oh, oh my God! How are you now? We knew each other. We kind of watched out for each other and talked with each other. It wasn't like everyone kept their own, you know, their, themselves. We were part of a community. Kids were. 9 and 12, I believe. So they moved in here. We spent about a year fixing up the house. So we would come back and hung the chandeliers, redid all the floors, and the ceilings had just so much woodwork and the trim, we just fell in love with this house. And so that's why we were like, this is gonna be our forever home. And we kind of began remodeling it with that in mind that we were gonna be here for the rest of our lives. Didn't know by the time we got it, we fixed, spent a year fixing it up that it would only be nine months after moving in that home completely changed. Kevin Ramsby was attacked in his Highland Park home in 2009. A man broke into his house, stabbed him 37 times, and left him for dead. Good morning, Emmanuel. How's everyone doing today? Yeah, I'd be cheering too if I got an extra hour of sleep than the early crowd, so you guys are a little happier. So, awesome to be here. It is such a privilege and honor to be here. How many love your pastors? Amen? We love Pastor Nate and Jody. They are amazing, amazing leaders and, and just, um, just so thankful for them. Um, we're going to get right into today's message and um, going to just be sharing a little bit of our story. Um, how many here have had faced it uh, a difficult time sometimes forgiving someone in your life? Especially those that don't own up to it or accept responsibility and uh, they just pretend like nothing happened. Uh, all of us have faced that. And so I want to kind of share with you, we're gonna, I'm going to talk with you a little bit of our story, but let me, I want to kind of rewind first because um, a couple years ago I faced almost like a second traumatic event uh, besides the one I'm gonna share about today. And it was when uh, there was a famous Hollywood producer, she contacted us in Detroit and she had heard about our story. And she was like really, um, they were like, hey, can we come to Detroit? We wanna film you, film your wife, film the police officers, your doctors. We heard about the miracle um, of your story and we wanted to come out and do a thing. We're producing a show for um, television, for the networks, and we wanted to highlight you and do a full like 30-minute segment just literally on your a show episode right on there. And, you know, at first I was a little reluctant because it's a kind of a famous Hollywood producer type, and I'm like, okay, for you guys, 
this is a story for me, this is my life, I don't know about this, and uh, kind of decided, you know what, let's give this a shot. And so this, um, this Hollywood producer, I'm not gonna say her name because there was a, an offense taken uh, in this, um, this little episode that she was about to create. And so she literally, they flew everyone out to Detroit. They kind of rented this hotel. They created their whole production studio in it. And for about two days straight, they just kept, they would come in, they would interview myself, my wife. Uh, they would interview, again, my doctor, the first responders that were on the scene um, of this home invasion. That the, and so, you know, I was like, you know what? It went pretty good. And so as usual, once uh, they do this filming process, they shoot it all, and then there's this editing time, and so about a year passed, and they were just getting ready to release this on the network, and so, you know, as you know, usual, we kind of created a little watch party. We said, you know what, let's invite friends and family over, and pastors around the country, they were all watching, they were, we were all excited for it, and when it aired, I was like, it was, it was pretty good. I was like, you know, they, they did a great job interviewing, capturing my wife, her story, my story, the doctors, but then something happened. And there was something that happened in this production in their final edit that they released. And it was when, um, it was when they uh, went from the true stories and the interviews to reenactment. And so for reenactment, you know what happens is they kind of bring in different actors and actresses to, to reenact certain scenes to, so it's not just an interview. And, and um, when they did it, something created an offense in my heart. And, I, and I, the best way for me to sum this up is going to be literally to just show you three pictures. The first picture is this. It's how I see me. There's Kevin. He's a good-looking guy. That's me right there. I've now put on a few pounds since that photo, but that's how I see me. This is how I thought they would see me on this episode. <laughs> and, and if they couldn't get that guy, if they couldn't get Joey, they were going to uh, get Brad Pitt in as a second and back up. And a third would be Kevin James. I kind of resemble him a little bit more, I think. Um, so, but that's, you know, that's how I thought they would see me. But then, here's where the offense got picked up. This is how they saw me, right there. And, and, and again, I'm not saying he's a bad looking guy. I'm not saying that. But just that face right there, that's how they portrayed me. They portrayed me as this little humdy, 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 humdy. Kind of like this dopey guy, it just kind of like, you know, if you had the seven doors, I'd been dopey. I'd have been like, uh, and, uh, and I was just like thrown off by it. And I was like, and instantly, uh, my wife and I, we pastored 24 years in the inner city of Detroit. So we've worked with gang members. We've run rehab homes. I mean, we've, we've done, the, we had a reputation to maintain. And in that split moment, when that man came walking out there going, Duh. I lost all street cred in the city of Detroit. I mean, I had my phone started blowing up. People were laughing, cry face emojis. And I was like going, this is horrendous. And, and right there, it was probably my second greatest traumatic event because now I had to face all these people. And every time I saw them, they was like, they would just laugh at me because that's how they saw me. But let me tell you, it was, um, but I got over that pretty quick. <laughs> Thankfully, I was able to forgive this producer for their, um, their embellishment of my good looks and how they, they did all that stuff. But what you saw in that video was, again, um, probably one of the darkest days of my life and really set up um, a dark period of times. Again, after pastoring in the city for 24 years, um, in 2009, a man, we lived in the city literally right down the block from our church, within a mile. Our, our church was an old triple X renovated movie theater turned into a house of worship. On one side was a strip club and the other side was a prostitute hotel. And we lived in that community. We loved our community. You saw Joe on that video. Joe was our friend. He would walk around the neighborhood with two nine millimeters on each hip, one on each hip, and he was our neighborhood protector. And, uh, but that was our community. And at three in the morning, a man who was high on crack cocaine he broke into my house. 
Uh, my family was not there at the time. They were supposed to be, but the night before, we changed up all of our plans, sent my wife away to go pick up my kids, so they thankfully were not there. But at three in the morning, this man broke in the window, and as he was climbing through the window, I did what every man would do. I picked up my choice weapon. I picked up my 12-gauge, um, 12 gauge strung tennis racket, and I began to <laughs> race down the stairs to confront whatever the sound of this noise was. And as I was racing down the stairs, all I could do, I was banging the walls with my racket, yelling as loud as I could, this is my house, this is my house, get out. And it was the last two steps um, of my stairwell with me running full speed toward the sound of the breaking glass. A man had already climbed through the house. He was armed with a large screwdriver and the largest knife that you would find in your knife block probably at home. And he was racing towards the sound of my voice yelling at him. When I hit those last two steps, all I could do in that split second as he raced, popped around the corner, surprised me, was to jump to tackle him. That split second, I <laughs> took my tennis racket and I saw him raise the knife. I tried to knock it out of his hand. I hit him barely because the knife went through the cover of it all, but it gave him a split second as I grabbed hold of his shoulders and landed about to tackle him. His first stab wound went into my abdomen and just ripped up with all of my momentum coming down. A fight ensued on the base of my foot uh, stairwell there. Wasn't much of a fight. Um, he just began throwing knife blow after knife blow. I just began trying to block him as much as I can, suffering a bunch of defensive wounds. One hitting me though, just missing my eye and my temple. One going all the way through my cheek. Two going through my throat, just missing the juggler. And it was awful. <laughs> I remember standing there thinking like, I can't believe this is happening to me. And it was that sp split second, while I'm having those thoughts, I, I collapsed to the ground. I couldn't, I, I just, I couldn't stand any longer. The wound was too deep, and as I fell, and just clapped with no strength to stand. I thought for a split second this guy would just go through the house to do whatever it was that he came to do. But instead of just going to look for whatever it was that he wanted, he jumped on top of me, straddled me and just began, again, just raining knife blow after knife blow down. Uh, there was a point where one time where the knife was coming down and I was able to catch it, and the entire blade, about that fat and about that long, broke off in my hand, where he's holding the knife blade and now, or the handle, and I'm now stuck with the blade. And in that split second, I'll be honest, I was hope because I felt like I could defend myself, and so I began trying to fight him off of me with the blade, Problem was, I wasn't holding on to a handle, and so therefore I couldn't hold on to the knife blade much um, because of the damage it caused. It fell out of my hand, dropped to the floor, and as he went to scramble to get it, I quickly rolled over because I knew I had to get off of my back, and just as I was ready to stand up again, he had retrieved the blade, got on my back, and once again resumed, resumed stab, and 10 more times to the back of the head, seven to the shoulder, and the worst, they were the six or so stabs to the base of the neck and my spine area where it felt like literally electrical shockwaves would just shoot through my body. I collapsed on my floor. I thought I was paralyzed. And I remember looking up and I had this black lab, a 70 pound black lab. Her name was Maggie. Everyone in the neighborhood was intimidated. She had the meanest bark. I mean, she was a good dog, but she, would, but she I just remember looking up and she was there and I was thinking, why aren't you doing anything? I'm like, you're a mutt. I'm like, I feed you, I walk you, I let you lick my face. I'm like going, ah! I'm like, take one for the team, do something, help me. And I just remember looking up at her and thinking she was like, huh, what's going on here? And, uh, and um, I said had, because after that night we donated her to our women's ministry home and we gave her to the ladies and we upgraded to Rocky the German Shepherd we got to get ourselves a real dog. Um, problem was, Rocky was too much of a dog for us, so we had to downgrade a year later to Buddy the diaper-wearing Yorkie. And, um, and so we had a little yipper for our protection. Um, so man's best friend failed me that night. And it was there on the floor that I felt all alone. I was, realized that no one was there to help me, not even Maggie. And um, the man for the first time spoke. He said, where's the keys, where's the money? 
told him, I don't have any money, I'm a pastor, <laughs> and keys are in the kitchen. He would go look for the keys when he couldn't find them, would come back, see me on the ground, he would stab me again, take me by the arm, begin dragging me towards the kitchen. Where's the keys, where's the money? And once again, I would say, I don't have any money, the keys are in the kitchen. He would drop me, go look for the keys, couldn't find them. They were under a piece of paper on our counter for Pete's sake. But when he couldn't find me, he'd come back, stab me again, drag me further to the kitchen, and then one last time he says, where's the keys? And at this moment, I'll just be honest with you, I was, I was angry because I knew, though I didn't know how bad I was hurt, how severely I was wounded, I knew that my life will never be the same and most likely it probably was about to end. And so when he asked and demanded for the keys one more time, I remember looking up as much as I could because I wanted to hear him. I yelled at him as loud as I could. It doesn't matter anymore because I'm dead. And it was at that moment I just began to pray. I began going in and out of consciousness. I prayed and just felt like God was nowhere around and prayed again specifically, <laughs> give me a verse or angels or lights and just, I was just desperate. I just needed God to know that he wasn't surprised like I was at three in the morning. And um, just when there was nothing, all I could do then is start praying my, kind of my last prayers and start praying for Sarah before everything happened. She had left to go to Illinois and we kind of had a little bit of a disagreement. It wasn't a fight, but it was a, we just kind of, parted our ways kind of abruptly, shortly, just kind of said, hey, we'll talk to you later. I am just remember thinking here how she's going to now live the rest of her life not knowing what I should have told her that morning. That was how much I loved her. And, um, and then prayed for, you know, my daughter. I just didn't want nothing to happen to her. I knew that her dad, as her dad, I wouldn't be there to protect her anymore. And um, so God was going to have to be her father. And then began praying for Noah, that Noah would uh, not blame God for what happened and that he would know living for Jesus is the greatest decision he could ever make in his life. And that's when I just heard words, they still need you. And then I realized that I needed to do something. <laughs> they still need me. And it just changed. I went from just waiting to die to like, I got to figure out how to get out of here. And I can't just accept this. I can't just stay down. I got to figure out. So. Thankfully, he actually dragged me here and I turned my head and looked this way and saw the side door. And when I saw the side door, it was then that I was, I was able to stand up, which was kind of crazy because before I couldn't move, I felt like I was paralyzed, stuck to the ground, but I was able to stand. My insides were out of me, so I had to pick them up. They were on the floor, so I had to pick up my insides. And um, so I was carrying them with my left hand. <laughs> was able to get down and it's kind of crazy. I was able to get through all the locks. This thumb was almost cut, you know, it was just so badly hurt that I couldn't had movement. So I don't even know how I got those doors open, but I was able to get out that side door. And um, that's when I, for the first time again, I felt like there was a little hope. And here's what I can say, there was no greater feeling in the world than to wake up about a week later in the hospital room and to realize I'm still here, I'm alive, and to wake up to the sound of this beautiful woman's voice, my wife Sarah. <laughs> and so, it was there in the hospital room that I quickly and we quickly began to understand that we were in a different type of fight now. It wasn't a fight to survive an attack. It was now going to be a fight to how to forgive and to experience the breakthrough that we were going to need to become whole and healed again after there's been a traumatic event or wounds or wrongs created by another. And so 
what we want to do is we're going to walk you through in our remaining time together. We want to share a little bit more about this topic of forgiveness and what we call the fight to forgive. And so for me, it was in that hospital room that I began really almost becoming tormented by the thoughts and the memories of everything that I just went through. It was centered around a man. His name was Wesley. He was my offender. He was the one who created the trauma. He was the one that was responsible for wounds. And all of you here today, most all of you will have some probably some story. You will not have a story like mine most likely, but I can tell you this, and we speak all over the country and we share this, it is more difficult oftentimes to forgive maybe the betrayal of a spouse than it is to for, for me to forgive a man who attacked me and stabbed me 37 times. Why? Because oftentimes wounds and wrongs and that hurt is um, in proportion to the intimacy of relationship you have with someone. This man was a complete stranger. I had no history. But for some of you, you've been hurt and wronged by whether it would be a family member, a spouse, someone that loved, someone that there was a relationship, a boss, and it can become even a greater fight to forgive those persons. But for me, that fight to forgive centered around this man named Wesley, and then it forgave, the fight to forgive uh, began to revolve around what he did to me, about forgiving him for the home invasion, forgiving him for stabbing me 37 times. Forgive him for the four feet of scars that now my body is riddled with because of his attack. To forgive him for the damage created to my hands and the wounds. My six perfect six pack that I used to is now, uh, what are you laughing at? That was really, now I'm offended with you here. <laughs> it is now more a jelly belly. Um, and so that's been ruined. Uh, the, the, I mean, so, and how, so how many know scars tell a story, don't they? All of us have scars, and they tell those stories. I had to forgive him for the theft that he took. The, at the end of the day, he got $3 out of my daughter's piggy, piggy bank and an old laptop computer. It was forgiving him for so much. And I'm going to have Sarah, Sarah to share a little bit, because in your fight to forgive, a lot of times we deal with personal forgiveness, about forgiving a person and then what they have done. But there's also an emotional side of forgiveness that oftentimes becomes even greater, uh, of greater difficulty to navigate. And that is how do you begin to forgive not just a person and what they did, but for what they've created in your life. The negative impact, the change, the damage, the wake that is left after a betrayal or a wound or a wrong. And so Sarah, would you take a few moments? I want you to go ahead and if you could share from your perspective, some of that impact that was created that we had to walk through in our fight to forgive. So um, thank you for having us, but I want to get right into it. You kind of heard exactly how Kevin um, was affected uh, physically and mentally. You can only imagine the spiritual and emotional um, healing that he needed. But I'm here to account for how sometimes um, when somebody attacks somebody close to you as a mama bear here it's like it there's no doubt that it doesn't trickle into your life and affect your life as well so um unfortunately for Kevin in this incident we were so overwhelmed with so much that was happening in our own family he was kind of left to fend for himself and his own forgiveness and I was just trying to pick up the pieces and help the rest of us cope with what was happening, but we didn't realize at the time that the, these are all parts of the forgiveness process that we we had to actively um, identify each one of these issues so that we could deal with them head on in order for us to get our healing. So um, right off the bat, um, overwhelming fear of the unknown, of, um, I, I mean, multiple things, uh, so many things that we lost, but um, from getting that first phone call in the middle of the night that nobody ever wants. I, I can't even tell you how horrifying that was with them not being able to give you any information other than they have information on your husband. Um, having to wake up my kids that were then nine and 12 years old, definitely old enough to ask all the appropriate questions and, you know, the, the, the thought that, you know, this whole process could just scare them was um, 
tough for, for a mom here. I, I had to really fight my own anger issues because I didn't want them to have to face some of that stuff. Um, one of the things that I remember having a conversation with Caitlin, she was nine years old at the time, and she asked why this happened to her father. And knowing in my adult brain, we'll never know why, probably. Like, I, I think um, every time you might see a life change, there's a little bit of the why, but you never get that full why. And um, having to explain to my nine-year-old daughter that there is evil in this world, and um, serving the Lord with all your heart doesn't exempt you from that evil coming up close and touching you. I know um, Noah was 12, and um, he became the serious kid overnight. He was going into seventh grade, and he had this great little um, confidence to him where he could be silly and laugh at himself and, and joke around, and he was just so lighthearted, and that was gone in an instant. All of a sudden, our son is dealing with the weight of the world on his shoulders, feeling like it was his responsibility to be the man of the house. Um, Kevin didn't um, explain that he came home in hand braces. He could not use his hands. His, he, he had a couple of fingers on each hand that were nearly severed. And so he had to have some surgeries to help repair tendons and nerves. So he couldn't use his hands. And then he also came home with um, open wounds that I had to pack and clean uh, twice a day. And um, one of the things that, you know, poor Kevin, he was stuck with me 24-7, but one of the things that our poor son had to do was step in. If I had to step away for a minute, he was, he was on daddy duty. And uh, poor Noah, the, the look on his face of, of sheer relief when I came home one time, and it was like, oh, mom is home. I, I'm off bathroom duty for dad. <laughs> I just, my, my heart goes out to my young kids and what they had to go through. But, but that was just the beginning of it. Um, so the innocence of, of their little lives was completely stolen from them. Um, myself, I, I didn't realize I'd created this bubble of protection imaginary in my head, thinking of all the different things that we'd encountered in the city of Detroit, how you, you, we had cars stolen, you know, shootings next door, but yet nothing ever directly attacked us or touched us. And for the first time, I realized that I had this bubble and that bubble didn't just leak, it completely exploded. And, and these, all these new fears that you never even could have imagined, um, because now if this horrific thing happened, what's next? What's going to happen next? We lost our home. Kevin really tried to, um, to stay in the house uh, that we were in, but he said that he would just come home at the end of the day and his, the hairs in his arms just were on end. He just, he was not comfortable. Um, so we moved four times in six years. I could go on and on. We, we had to deal with bankruptcy, um, just on and on of how it personally affected us around him. Even though he was dealing with all he was dealing with, we all had our own things that we were dealing with and working through. And so we discovered after experiencing those big physical life hurts, the additional emotional hurts that followed were just too many to name. Um, so you're about to see in our record of wrongs, you'll see that it goes far beyond the person and what he did. Um, but it created a lasting impact of hurt and wounds that we knew as a family we had to deal with. That's right. So what you're seeing here is, <clears throat> again, the Bible alludes to it about how love keeps a record of no wrongs, right? <clears throat> and oftentimes what happens is when someone hurts you or wrongs you, we begin, um, some people call it, we begin retelling a grievance story. And it's what the story that is continuously retold in our minds. And that's what was taking place as the days and weeks and months began to as our grievance story began being unfold, unfolded. And it centered around, again, a person who hurt me. It's a person who attacked me. And he did all of these things. But what we had to understand is that when it came to fighting to forgive, that we were going to have to address all of it, not just part of it. Forgiveness, it's not just a personal forgiveness, it's about, it's about a forgiveness that also involves the emotional side of forgiving that's associated oftentimes that is evoked by all of the, again, the things that happen afterwards. My parents, they divorced at a, when I was in 
um, early in my, in my teenage years, and they divorced, and you know what happened? That divorce began to leave a wake of impact on my dad's life that lasted many, many, many years to follow. It actually led him to um, a painkiller addiction because he tried to cope through the pain. And so though he might have said the words, I forgive your mom, and I might have forgive her for divorcing me, he was never able to fully forgive from the heart because what it did is it began, to, in his mind, it began the impact that created when he had to lose part of his pension and now all of a sudden he lost his home and now there's this change, his lifestyle had to change all because of this, this divorce. And so it is with all of us. There's this impact. And so what we've got to do is we've got to understand that we've got to fight to forgive. And so what I want to walk us through here um, in, in our story is what I call transactional forgiveness. Because here on this board, it lists not all everything, but a lot of it. But it, it in deals with the anger, the bitterness. It's forgiving for the suicidal thoughts and thoughts of suicide as I began to hunt this man down as he was on the run for three months. It's the loneliness, forgiving him for the loneliness, the hopelessness that created. It's forgiving him for the denying of guilt as he tried to say he wasn't the one that attacked me in the trial. It's for having to forgive him over, because how many know forgiveness is never a one-time event? It's a lifetime of, of decisions. And the enemy will do anything he can to cause something to trigger you to go all the way back to square one. And so that's why you have to learn and we have to deal with forgiveness in its entirety if we really want to experience the breakthrough. We want to experience the peace and the joy and all that God has us and even discover God's plan and purposes through these situations so that God can work all things together for the good. Because if it's not good yet, how many know God's not done yet? And so we've got to begin to do this. And so what I want to do in our remaining our time is I want us to deal with this area of forgiveness, because I know in this room this size, there are stories upon stories upon stories. And at every campus, there's stories represented of these trauma, traumatic events and these wrongs and these wounds that have been created sometimes decades ago that have been left buried and you've tried to just move forward, but the reality is you're still stuck because the mention of their name the mention of reading on Facebook, seeing their, how good things are going in their life, it just gets under your skin going, Ugh, they don't deserve it. That shouldn't be. And then you look at your story and you're still the victim. You're still the one wrong. So the question begins is this, how do we deal with this forgiveness? There was a quote, uh, one of my counselors said this, to undo any traumatic event or wrong or wound created by another, you have to have an equal or greater experiential moment. Do you hear that? To undo a traumatic event or wrong or wound created by another, you have to have an equal or greater experiential moment. And for us, what we discovered in undoing the traumatic event that this man into wrongs and wounds, that experiential moment, that greater experiential moment is what we call transactional forgiveness. It's called forgiving just as God through Christ forgives us. That's what Ephesians 4.32 says. Ephesians 4.32 says that we are to forgive just as, says forgiving one another, just as God through Jesus Christ has forgiven you. For a believer, that's the mandate. We so oftentimes, as we've tried to think that forgiveness is a choice, Forgiveness is a process. Forgiveness is something that takes time. Listen, how do I just, how do you forgive all of that? It was too much for me. And I had to figure out, and I wrestled with it, again, to the point that bitterness, when I thought I, I said the words, I forgive Wesley, but then I found every consuming moment trying to find him, trying to hunt him, wanting justice, wanting him to hurt. And I found that though I said the words, forgiveness is not something spoken. It's exactly what the Bible says in Matthew 18, that forgiveness is supposed to come fully from the heart. So how do we begin to do this? How do we begin to do this? So forgiveness Forgiving just as, the word just as, just so you know, it says this, it means to, and according to the manner in which, in the degree that, in proportion to, corresponding to, or exactly just as. 
So we're to forgive just as God through Christ. How many are thankful God doesn't put us on probation? How many are thankful that God doesn't, doesn't, doesn't look at forgiveness as a process and something that just takes time for him? It's, a, it, it's an act of the will. It's the character of God to forgive. So what I want to do in our remaining minutes here, I want us to quickly look at three elements of what makes up transactional forgiveness. Because to forgive this man of everything that he did to me, the starting point was for me to come here and I was gonna have to deal with this issue, this record of wrongs, which was my record of wrongs that led Jesus Christ to be crucified on a cross. It was my addiction to pornography. It was my pride. It was my drug use. It was selling the drugs. It was me and my anger, my immorality, my selfishness. All of those things that the Lord has had to forgive and deal with my heart. It was the, the bomb threat I did in high school that I thankfully, I don't do that no longer. And, uh, <laughs> and yes, there was punishment and yes, there was problems there. But all of this became my starting point and key if I was ever gonna wanna deal with how do I forgive the people of hurt me, and then on top of it, they're not even willing to acknowledge that they were wrong or apologize or try to make things right. So I wanna give you three aspects because again, we're to forgive just as, everyone say just as. Just as God through Jesus Christ has forgiven you. That is the forgiveness mandate of a Christ follower today. So how does God forgive us? First of all, through Jesus Christ, it's a substitution. So transactional forgiveness is a substitution. So what's gonna happen here is this. How many are thankful that, so when God comes and he wants to forgive us, forgiveness is not just a choice. God doesn't just sit there and go, hmm, pornography, let me think. Should I forgive him today? Should I not forgive him? How many know God doesn't sit here going like, should I, should I or should I not forgive? How many know that God doesn't say forgiveness is a process and it takes a time before I forgive? He doesn't sit here and say, oh, there he is with that attitude again. This one's, ah, he did it again. It's gonna take me a couple weeks for me to forgive him now. And God's gonna give me the silence treatment because how many know sometimes that's what we do, the silent treatment when we're upset? How many are thankful God doesn't do the silent treatment? Or God doesn't say, you know what? For me to forgive you this time because of your this, your, your lying or your gossiping, this time, you're gonna have to prove yourself to me. That's not how God forgives us. The way God forgives us is through Jesus Christ, first of all. And so what that means is this. It means that Jesus was literally doing everything on our behalf. He was the one. But it also leads to the second part here of what involves transactional forgiveness, and it's this. It involves atonement, or another word for atonement is covering. And so Sarah's gonna help me here to kind of illustrate this. What is atonement? Atonement, it is the cross. The word atonement, it's taking an action to amend a wrong that has been done. It's, so when you apologize for something, that's an action that you're doing to amend for something that's done wrong. But again, oftentimes the people who've hurt and ruined us they're not apologizing. They're not trying to make the amends. So how do we forgive if they're not willing to do the action? Again, it calls for a substitution, Jesus Christ. But it, now it comes into this. It's what he did on the cross. It's his death and the shedding of his blood. So the word atonement means covering. And there's two aspects to covering, two benefits in a sense, what it does. When Jesus shed his blood on the cross, it does something for you and I, for the ones who are guilty. It covers our sins, right? It washes them away. It washes away all of our sins. He covers them, why? And now we can't see them, right? But how many know sometimes our past kind of bleeds through and all of a sudden what we have been forgiven for all of a sudden reappears, right? But does that mean that we were never originally forgiven? No. So sometimes forgiveness, again, even with God, we have to keep going back to him and saying, God, forgive me once again, because that is the nature of sin. So atonement involves covering. It's a covering. But it does something else that's important because it doesn't just cover our wrongs and it then completely exonerate me as not guilty. It does something for God. 
And here's what it does for God. It satisfies the emotional side of God, the emotional nature of God, the wrath of God. Because when we sin, how many know God gets angry? God doesn't sit here and go, oh, that was a bad decision. No, there's something, it's, it's connected to the justice and righteousness of God. He sees what we did and it evokes this emotional response. And so God now has to, his wrath and his anger has to be satisfied when we sin. And so when, he, when our sins are covered with the blood of Jesus, we benefit because they're washed away. But here's what it does. It satisfies God's emotional, his, the emotional wrath, the wrath, the anger part, so that when God looks at us, you know what he sees? Not our past or what we've done. He sees the blood of his son. He sees the substitution in the blood that was shed. And now he looks at us. And you know what it does? It leads us to the third part of transactional forgiveness is it leads us to how God now, he remembers our sins no more. And what it means that God remembers our sins no more, he's not talking about an absence of memory. What he's talking about there is that he allows our past wrongs, our sins, to no longer influence or impact us or influence or affect how he relates to us. So when God forgives us, his anger goes away, our past is covered, but how he relates to us now is this, not on the basis of what is under the blood, he relates to us on basis of the blood. He looks at us and he goes, no, 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 you're forgiven. You're my son, your child. I'm not putting you on probation. I'm not gonna allow what you did in the past, though I could tell you what you did and recall it, I'm not gonna allow your past to impact me any longer. It's not, good. You're, you're fully a son. You're fully loved. You don't have to earn it. You don't have to prove it. I have forgiven you. That's the power of forgiveness because transactional forgiveness involves forgetting. Again, Hebrews 8, 12, I will forgive their wickedness and will remember their sins no more. Um, I, I love Hebrews 10, 17, I will never again remember their sins and lawless deeds. In other words, God says, I will keep your past out of mind. He also says this, I'll keep it out of sight. Psalms 103, 12, he has removed our sins as far as the east is from the west. So it's out of mind, out of sight. And then I love this, it's out of reach. It's out of reach is Isaiah 44, 12, I've swept away your offense like a cloud, your sins like the morning mist. So God comes and he forgives and he forgets. In other words, not an absence of memory, but he says, your past is not gonna no longer dictate how I relate to you. I'm going to be able to be kind towards you. I'm going to be able to bless you. I'm going to be able to look at you in a way that's not out of revenge. You don't have to prove it. You're forgiven. How many are thankful for God's for forgiveness? So here it is in closing. How are we to forgive the people who have wronged us and hurt us? How do we get that breakthrough? Not by just through your own willpower saying, I choose to forgive. Not, it's gonna just take some time. We're to forgive just as God through Christ has forgiven me. So we do the same process. You need to involve Jesus in your story. You need a substitution. I love how when Jesus is on the cross, you know what he says? He doesn't say, I forgive you. He even cries out for a substitution. God, Father, you forgive them for they know not what they do. Stephen, when he's being stoned, he wasn't sitting there dodging the rocks going, I forgive you, I forgive you, I forgive you for trying to kill me. <laughs> he says, God, he looks up, don't hold this sin against me. You need a substitution. How do you forgive the wrongs and the wounds and the impact? You look up. You look up. It's the Christ in you that lives, that gives you the strength through the power of the Spirit to do what you think is something that can't be done. But not only that, you cover their wrongs. Biblically speaking, you cover their wrongs with love. <laughs> and what is love? Kindness, patience, keeping no records, you cover their wrongs, listen, with the same blood that forgives you of yours, the same blood that covers all of your wrongs or wounds that put the Savior to the cross is the same blood that 
can cover and forgive the wounds and wrongs committed against you. His blood is that powerful, but you need to involve him in your story. And lastly, you keep, you keep that past. The fight is this, to keep it out of sight, out of reach, and out of mind. And every time you're triggered to go back to the fence, you look up and you keep running after Jesus. Your focus is set on something different now. Those triggers are supposed to trigger a new response into you. It says, you know what? This isn't about the past now. This is about my future. God has worked. Let me just share this one closing. Because of forgiveness, listen, I am so nervous every time I get up here and speak, I just panic almost. But you know what? Because of forgiveness, you know what God's been able to do? I've been able to see both police officers, first responders come to Jesus Christ. I've seen God now, for the last 11 years, I've written and talked to my attacker in prison. I have been a witness and a light. I've reached out to his family members on his behalf. I'm one of the only people in his life that actually still talks to him. Because of that, God has opened doors to the ministry that we do on death row. How, why? It's because of breakthrough through forgiveness. And what's on the other side of your breakthrough is this. You're probably gonna bump into the purposes of God and the plans of God in a greater way in your life. Why? Because you're no longer held in bondage to the past or the people or the wrongs. Through the power and blood of Jesus, they're all now undone. So would you just stand with me to your feet? I wanna pray for you in closing. I just wanna pray for you. Would you just close your eyes across this place? And I just want you to take a second and I want you to allow the Holy Spirit right now to speak to you. Because some of you have been wanting breakthrough desperately. You've wanted to understand God's ways. You wanted to hear his direction. You want to know his plans. And you're sitting here, why, why can I not do it? What's going on? Could it be that you need to forgive from the heart today? With no one looking around real quickly, as if you're in this place, wherever you're at, and you would say, there is someone that I might have said the words or even told them or even others that I've forgiven them. And I've forgiven them for what they've done. But the issue remains what they've created, how they've impacted me negatively. Those parts, they're still very much alive in my heart. And it's now turned and it's even maybe become a little bit of a root of bitterness. And it's not that I wanna hurt them but the issue is now this, because I haven't forgiven them, I'm still hurting myself. If you're here today in a count of three and say, listen, the Holy Spirit is, there's someone in my story, there's someone in my past, there's someone in my life that has done something traumatic to me or wounded me or wronged me and I haven't fully been able to forgive them in a way that God has forgiven me where they're not on probation, they don't have to prove themselves. I'm not making them jump through all these hoops. It's just whether they own up to it, whether they make amends, it doesn't matter anymore. I want freedom, I want breakthrough. If there's someone here today that says, I need an experiential moment today on February 18th, 2024, that I could say on this day, I invited Jesus Christ. I asked the Father to step into my story, apply the blood of the Son to not only the, to my sins, but the very ones that have been committed against me. And today I'm gonna keep looking up to you. If that's you on the count of three, would you just lift your hands up? One, two, three. If there's someone in your story right now, lift it up real big, real big. Yep, 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 yep. Would you just all just do this? Would you pray with me if you raise your hand? Say, dear Jesus, thank you for the cross. Thank you for the blood. I ask you right now, Jesus, that you would intervene on in my story. I've tried to forgive. I've said the words I forgive, but I haven't fully forgiven in my heart. Would you right now, Jesus, intervene? Would you apply your blood that has forgiven me to the very wrongs and wounds created by another, would you cover them so that today I could be free, that I could experience breakthrough. Today, I release them into your hands. Help me now to fight 
to forgive each day forward. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you. Wow. Would you give it up for Kevin and Sarah again? I just am grateful for the powerful story. Powerful story. You know, I just believe that, that when you hear a message like that, there's a hearing part and then there's an applying part. When you hear it, then you apply it. And, uh, and I want to encourage everyone under the sound of my voice to not just be a hearer of the word, but be a doer of the word. To now say, God, would you help me? I know there are many of us that we need to be, just say, Lord, I need your blood to cover all of this because it's got a hold on my own life. I need your forgiveness. There are things that maybe you haven't confessed or things that you haven't brought out. That you got to, and it might not even involve somebody else. It could be other things in here, and you got to say, God, I'm, I'm an open book. I want your blood applied to my life, all of it, all the dark stuff, all the things I hide out, all the secrets. Bring it into the light. And then there's many of us that we've got a name attached underneath, and all the other things that are going on, and we just simply need to say, God, would you, would you? Bring Jesus into that part of the story, as Kevin said. Would you now bring that in? And what we're going to do is while we're singing right now, I want to challenge you, double dog dare you, to not just sing the words, although that's helpful, but in this moment, would you bring your heart to God and say, God, would you do this work in me? If you feel comfortable enough, I want to encourage you to come forward and bow your knee at the altars or in the balcony. Many times people will go to the back of the room as your own altar if you wanted to come down here. But let's apply it and just say, God, I'm bringing my heart to you. In fact, lift up your hands even now. Would you, church, just, God, we come before you. and We ask, oh God, that you would see into us. And as you see into us, oh God, that you would apply the blood of Jesus to our current story, to the minds and the hearts of every person here. I pray, God, that there would no longer be those bound up in the prison of pain and our own sin, but we would receive your forgiveness freshly even today. And then, Lord, that you would enable us, oh God, to have the power through the blood of Jesus to forgive others. And so, Lord, we bring our hearts to you. We ask, God, that you do a miracle in us today in Jesus' name. These altars are open, and uh, in a couple minutes after we're done singing, we'll do a final dismissal in the service. But I want to encourage you, as you sing, if you want to come forward, feel free to do it. Are you hurting and broken within? Overwhelmed by the weight of your sin? Jesus is calling Have you come to the end of yourself? Do you thirst for a drink from the well? Jesus is calling. Oh, oh, oh. oh come to the altar. The Father's arms are open wide. Forgiveness was born with the precious blood of Jesus Christ. Oh, 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 oh. leave behind, leave behind your regrets and mistakes. Come today, there's no reason to wait. Jesus is calling, oh, bring your sorrows and trade them for joy, from the ashes a new life is born, Jesus is calling, come on, no oh, come to the altar, the Father's arms
Oh, yeah.